want to. <laughs> you can turn around. <laughs> and then we move towards the ground, right? So it goes one way, then the other way, up, down, and around. All right? So, or however you feel, all right? Because we don't have all day. <laughs> So 
that you can impart information, facts, background, set the stage for something. <laughs> or maybe you like the other uh, definition better. That long, long tirade that comes after you've done something wrong. <laughs> that I heard Mark Twain said about lecture. He said um, that that is when college professors' notes get transferred to student lecture notes without passing through the brain <laughs> of either. <laughs> of either as well. I love stories because they give us time for the facts and the information to come into our brain, stir up our imaginings, touch our hearts, places we never thought we could ever go. It was, I was finished with college before I heard this story. It's not a Rhode Island story, I'm going to get to that, but I wanted to tell you this first because of how powerful it was for me to make a connection really with Africa, in history and the journey across the water to this side of the world. And it's a story that especially touched me and moved me because it was not, sorry, about slavery. And because it wasn't about slavery, it opened my mind even wider to the experiences and the stories and the wisdom and the knowledge that peoples all over the world have. And depending on who tells the story, determines how that story is framed. So here's how I will tell you the story of this great explorer. Maybe you've heard of him, Abu Bakr. Anybody ever heard of him before? <laughs> really? You did it? How about Christopher Columbus? Mm. Okay. Right. Just checking. <laughs> well, you might know why this story was so important to me. In 1492, I know Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but I want to take you back to a time before then. I want to take you back to 1310, because back in the day in the Empire Mali, there was a king, his name was Abu Bakari. Not the first, but the second one to carry the name. When he took the throne, things would never be the same. We're going back. Way, way back, we're going back. Way, way back, we're going back. Everyone was standing outside the palace gates. They were waiting to see the mighty king come through. Oh, you should have seen it. The young men were mounted up on their horses. The young girls were standing in front, getting ready to do their finest dances. The drummers were ready, and the old women stood beside the palace gate, and as soon as the gate opened, they were the ones who let everybody know. <coughs> and as soon as that signal was given, the drums began to play, and everybody began to sing, and Abu Bakri, the mighty king of Mali, began to walk through the crowds. They rolled the carpet out on the dirt so that his royal feet would not touch the earth. And the crowds parted as he made his way to the royal platform. It wasn't probably much bigger than this. But they didn't have this kind of canopy. No, they had a royal um, 
umbrella overhead, and underneath there were cushions. Abu Bakri stepped up onto the dais and he seated himself on those cushions and he clapped his hands. And when he did, his royal advisors came close and they bowed low before the king. And he ordered one to stand up. It was his military advisor. Let me hear your report, the king said. And so the man began to speak. He said, your majesty, we are doing very well. We have been capturing small towns and villages all around. And your majesty, if we could have some reinforcements, some more military, some more young men on horses such as this, we would be able to capture the mighty city of Den. And there they say, there are there who know how to make old eyes see again. And, Your Majesty, they say also that there are scholars as learned as the ones in Timbuktu. Your Majesty, Your Majesty, they could see that Abu Bakri was only listening with half an ear. He was staring off into the distance. Your Majesty, ah, ah, ah. The king raised his hand and silenced his advisor and everybody else. He said, I'm tired of talking about the war. He stared off in the distance again and they could see the Senegal River just off that way. He said, um, have you ever seen the sea? That was the question he asked his military advisor and his military advisor said, ah, ah, no, Your Majesty, I've never seen the sea. Oh, Your Majesty, they say that all life began in the sea and all life will end in the sea. And Your Majesty, my life has already begun and I'm not ready for it to end anytime soon, if you know what I mean, you see. <laughs> the king wasn't laughing. He was still staring off towards the water and he said, when I was young, there was a servant in the palace. And he told me that this river here leads to a great big body of water, the sea. He told me that that body of water is as big as the sky above our heads. And he told me also that if anyone could travel across that sea, they would find land on the other side and people living there, like we live here, or maybe not the same. And then he turned back to all of his advisors and he said, I'm not interested in this war like I told you. I want to see the sea. And with that, he stood up and he clapped his hands and as soon as he did that, his advisors stepped back. They threw their bodies on the ground as a sign of respect. And then Abu Bakri walked off of that platform and he walked back along that carpet. He went back through the gates and the gates clanged shut. And only when he was gone did the people start to talk. Did you hear? The king doesn't want war anymore. The king wants to travel across the sea. Everybody thought he had lost his mind, but he was determined. He called the scholars from Timbuktu, and they came with the knowledge that they had about how to read the direction in the stars at night. They came with their idea, their new philosophy, their new theory that the world was not flat, but in fact shaped like a gourd. And if you started in one spot and kept on going, perhaps eventually you would end back where you began. He called on anybody who knew anything about ships, boats, how to travel across the water. Some said the best way was narrow boats that you could sit in and move through the water with oars. Others said, no, you need wider boats with masts and sails to catch the wind. Since he didn't know what was right, he ordered all different kinds of boats to be built. And soon, 200 boats were 
were built. <laughs> 100 filled with crew to travel and 100 boats filled with supplies. And when it was time for that fleet to set sail, Abu Bakri commanded that they go and not return until they had a story to tell about what they had seen on the other side of the sea. And off they went. In Mali, they say that after that, the king was really crazy. He couldn't sleep. He could barely eat. He wasn't interested in his wives. Even the children's songs didn't interest him. And he tossed and turned at night. And one night, or maybe it was that special time of day just before dawn, he woke up and he called his storyteller. Kuyate, come! And so the storyteller ran to the king's bedside. Kuyate, I've had a dream, and I want you to tell me what it means. All right, tell me your dream. The dream I had, 200 blackbirds sailing in a beautiful formation in a beautiful sky, and then all of a sudden one What is the meaning of my dream? And the storyteller, the griot, said, uh, Oh, your majesty, 200 birds. Oh, why, sir, that is the 200 ships that you sent out across the water. Yes, yes, and then what about the one that fell? Oh, well, your majesty, I... I'm, I'm not sure. Just then, there was a knocking, and one of the servants excused himself and came in, Your Majesty, I'm sorry, but there's a man outside the gate, and he says that he is a captain from one of your ships, and before the words were even off the servant's lips, the king was up and racing to the gates, and when he got there, there was a man standing there in tattered clothes, and when saw the king, he pulled the cap off of his head, and he threw his body on the ground, a sign of respect. No, get up, get up, get up! What are you doing here? And the man stood and he said, Your Majesty, I am captain of one of your ships. Yes, yes, and what, what? Well, I was in the very last boat that you sent out down the river. Yes, and what happened? Well, Your Majesty, I, I followed everyone down the river. And then we came to a place where I could see that the mouth of the river opened up into a great big body of water. Your Majesty, it was as big as the sky above us. And Your Majesty, one by one, the ships ahead of me went into that space. Yes? But when it was my turn, I, I, I was frightened. And, and I turned back. The others? What about the others? Your Majesty, I, I don't know. Well, when the king received that news, he didn't give up. Instead, he ordered those shipbuilders to start again. And this time, a hundred boats would not be enough. Two hundred boats would not be enough. One thousand boats were built, and each one had another supply boat attached to it. And when that fleet was finished, Abu Bakri II did not send them off without him. Instead, he handed his kingdom over to his brother and he left his storyteller behind. And then the people of Mali say that Abu Bakri got on board one of those ships and sailed down that river and was never seen again. And for a long time, people thought that was the end of the story because it was on that side of the world. But we know that if you travel across the water, there is more
more land and there is more life and they say that people in the area that we now call Brazil tell a story from 1312. They say that their ancestors say that one day they went down to the water and when they looked up from doing their morning prayers to the gods and the ancestors that they ships coming across the water and that standing on the decks of one was a black man dressed in white robes. They thought it was their God coming across the sea. But as people have shared stories across the water, think, aha, perhaps it was, in fact, Abu Bakari, his dream come true. We know when Columbus got to this side of the world, there were Africans on the ships with him. We know when he got to this side of the world that he reported finding people who looked African and statues and carvings with African features. In 1492, I know Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but I want to take it back to a time before then. I want to take it back to 1310, because back in the day in the Empire Mali, there was a king, his name was Abu Bakari. Not the first, but the second one to carry the name. When he took the throne, things would never be the same. We went back. Way, way back, we went back. That's a fact. And that's a story for you. Thank you. I share that story whenever I can, um, but particularly with young people, and particularly young people who look like me. Because unfortunately, my first understanding about transatlantic crossing was in the shameful period that we studied and learned about around slavery. Now, I know that there's so much more. And that even the stories that come from that period of our history are much more textured and much more complex than we really know. And that exploring the stories and the lives of people who survived a passage like that is kind of perhaps like digging for treasure in a shipwreck. Maybe. A few years ago I was walking through that cemetery with uh, local black historians Keith Stokes and his wife Teresa Guzman Stokes and they showed me those stones that I alluded to. And then we walked along School Street, which is not far from here, and they pointed out a house and they said, that's where Duchess Quamino lived. She was the greatest cake maker in Rhode Island. Why, she even served George Washington. And when I heard that, <laughs> I said, what's that? You know, right? What do you know? What do you know? What do you know? Tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more. So Teresa and Keith pointed me in the direction where I could find some of the facts that we know about Duchess Quamino and her husband, John. And that journey led me across the sea to Ghana, West Africa. I'm wearing a dress that I bought on that trip. I'm wearing, I have some kente cloth here from Ghana that I got on that trip. I went to the place called Anamabu, which is, used to be a prison, and before that it was a slave fort, and was the 
now the scholars are saying the most important slave port for Rhode Island, Newport, Rhode Island in particular, Anamabu, which is just up the way from Cape Coast Castle, if you know anything about that. So we know some things about Duchess. And we know some things about John. And most of the way we know these things is because their uh, significant moments in life were recorded by white men. Did they talk to you about this the other night? A little bit. A little bit. You might have been sleeping. <laughs> it happens. Um, they were so significant things about Duchess were recorded by the hands of white men. If you go to the cemetery and you see her stone, it's kind of fading away. But even the words on her stone were written by William Ellery Channing. But I wanted to, I'm going to give you little snippets of the facts, and then I'm just going to tell you her story. And maybe I know you've been talking a lot about, we've got this fact, we've got this information, how do we market it? How do we get it out there so that people might find a way to be engaged with what it is that we know? Okay, so what we know about Duchess is that she was born around 1739, that she came here to Newport probably on a ship called the Elizabeth in 1753. It stopped off in Barbados first. She was purchased by the Channing family and lived on School Street. And in 1769, she married John Quamino, who was going to be sent back to Africa as a missionary, but then the war broke out and he couldn't go. He did sign up to be a privateer, he died, and Duchess had to find her own way to become free and to become the most famous uh, cake maker in Rhode Island. Is that interesting? <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> I mean, you know, it is. when she heard John and she might be able to go back home. So I'm going to imagine myself telling her story. It was the Monday after Easter in April, 1773. Duchess was in the kitchen. That's where she spent most of her time. She was so good at baking any kind of bread, cakes, cookies, plum cakes especially. Everybody loved. And there she was in the kitchen when the door opened and her husband, John, came in. She could tell by the look on his face that he was busy thinking, John, what is it? Duchess. Duchess, Reverend Stiles has asked me to come and, and visit him this afternoon. She said, why? Because uh, he said he wants me to read for him. And he said he and Reverend Hopkins have a plan that they'd like to see if I'd be interested in. Well, when Duchess heard this information, she looked at her husband and she said, well, if Reverend Stiles is calling for you to come, of course you must go, but make sure you come back before 9 o'clock. You know what happens after 9. In Newport, if any of the African people were on the streets after 9, they could be arrested and put in jail or beaten, whatever it was, that people make sure you come back after 9. And so John said he would, and out he went. All the rest of the afternoon and into the evening, as Duchess was kneading the dough and letting it rise, and kneading the dough and letting it rise, she wondered what was happening with John and Reverend Stiles. And when he finally came back, well before nine, he sat down and told her everything that had happened. He could hardly contain himself. He said, Duchess, Duchess, Reverend Stiles and Reverend Hopkins have this plan. They want to send some Africans back home to Africa so that we can bring the gospel back home. And they would like me and Bristol Yama to be the ones to go. Duchess looked at her husband. She said, they want to do what? They want to send us back home. Duchess, we can go home. Duchess hadn't thought about home in a long time. Why, she could barely remember it. 
Oh, it had been over 15 years, almost uh, close to 20 years since she'd been in Newport. When she was living back home, the they called it the Guinea Coast, she just called it home. Her father was a, was a prince, at least that's what she always said, and he was the one who called her Duchess first. But she'd been captured when she was about 14, and she remembered that travel across the water in the belly of a slave ship, and she could not imagine making that passage back. John, on the other hand, had a very different way of getting here. His father was the big chief right at the edge of the water where he lived, in the place called Anamabu, Bird's Rock. And his father had welcomed the ship that had come with Captain Benjamin Church from Newport. And his father had said to Captain Church, take my son to America. Teach him how to read and write. He needs an education. And then deliver him back to me. Because you see, that had been happening all up and down the coast. Why, John knew people who had gone off to France and come back speaking Francais and wearing fancy clothes. He was excited about the idea that he would be going to America to learn something. But of course, once he got here, Captain Benjamin Church didn't keep his promise. He did see to it that John learned reading and writing, but he didn't set him free. Instead, he kept him enslaved until John and Bristol Yama had pooled their money together and they had bought a lottery ticket in Massachusetts and won 300 pounds, which they split, by the way, and that half of that money was enough for John to be free. <laughs> but he wanted his whole family to be free. And he wanted them to go home. And Duchess did too. John, John, that's wonderful. He told her that Rev Reverend Stiles had pulled out the good book, the Bible, and made him read from the book of John in Psalm 98. He said, I read pretty well, but he wants me to practice my reading. Letters to the fort in Ghana at Cape Coast, asking, did anybody know anything about John Kwamenu's family? Here are the names. And letters came back in boats across the sea, saying, yes, everything he has told you is true. His mother wants to see him again before she dies. His uncle says, come home. Yes, send them. And plans were being made. Part of the important plan was that John needed to be better educated, so he and Bristol were to get on a ship right here at the wharf and head to Princeton, New Jersey, to work with the college president there so that they could better their skills and their knowledge. When Duchess walked John down to the wharf, it was a cold day in November, and despite the horrible weather and the rough passage along the water, they made it safely there. But perhaps you know what happened. Soon, all plans of going home in this way were put aside because the war broke out. The American Revolution, the war. And when that war broke out, John and Bristol were shipped back up here and all, all effort, all energy went from going home to Africa to securing freedom from Britain here. There wasn't much of a navy, and so they were calling on volunteers to, to staff the privateers, the small boats that would interrupt that British navy. And so John signed up. If I do, he said to Duchess, when we win, I will have money and our family will be free. John went off, but he didn't come back. The privateer that he was a part of, nobody knows for sure what happened, but he died. Duchess was in the kitchen right up the road when she received the news that her husband wasn't coming home. Now what? 
how will I be free? Her hands were in the dough, and she went to her slaveholders, Mr. Channing, and she asked permission, may I use the ovens? I'd like to make pies and cakes and cookies. I, I would like to make some money for myself. And they said yes. And so Duchess got busy. Not only did she do the work for the family, but she made extra things. And on African market day, she came right out to the market and she sold pies and cakes and cookies for herself. And she saved every bit of money that she could until she had enough to purchase her freedom. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The colonists, they won the war. And Duchess won her freedom by her own hands. When the war was done, the great General George Washington was coming into Newport. Duchess, will you make the cakes? Will you make your plum cakes? Of course I will, she said. Of course I will. And she did. And for years after that, they would have a Washington's Ball. And every year, Duchess Quamino would make her plum cakes, honoring General George Washington, who then became the first president, thinking of her husband, John and his fight for freedom and giving thanks for her own hands which had made her free right here in this town beside the sea. Duchess Kwamino and her daughters, Violet and Cynthia, rest in peace just a quarter mile from where we sit. I imagine the stones speak, but if they don't, perhaps the eagles sing, or the wind carries the story, or the waves tell the tale. Baba yo, Baba aye, Baba Lorisha, Baba okay, Baba yo. Thank you, everyone. I, please join me in thanking Valerie for such a wonderful Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And on behalf of NMEA and the NMEA 2015 committee, we have a few things for you. This was actually uh, hand etched. Wow. Some candy for you to enjoy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, An NMEA 2015 t shirt. Yes. Yeah, it just goes very well. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice, nice. Thank you. Thank you. And a card for you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you again. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.